Hello folks, J. Scott Phillips here, and uh, welcome to my channel. This is my first video, and uh, we'll see how this goes. I've been meaning to do this for quite a while, uh, maybe a couple of years already, but uh, at the encouragement of many and the procrastination of one, I'm finally getting around to doing this. And uh, I'm going to start off with talking today about... Uh, uh, Dying Inside by Robert Silverberg. And this is a book that uh, I first read back in 1976. I was back in college and I was taking a science fiction class. And this was one of the books that uh, we were uh, uh, assigned to read and discuss in class. And uh, I haven't read it since. I've just reread it, but I haven't read it in all those years. And uh, this is a book that always stuck with me. Rereading it now, I'm I, I realized that uh, uh, this book actually took place in 1976. It was written in 1971 by Robert Silverberg, just after he wrote uh, The Book of Skulls. And uh, he was in kind of a transitional period then himself. He was uh, moving from New York to Los Angeles and wrote a couple of books, and then I guess there was a little bit of a dry spell. But uh, he wrote when he wrote it in 71, it was published in 72, and, uh, but he wrote it a few years into his future then. Uh, so uh, it's kind of incidental. I'm not sure why he really did that. It didn't really make much difference as to the time for when this took place, except that he wrote this book um, with a lot of autobiographical information uh, uh, in it, or an auto autobiographical take on it. He's the same age as, the, as our protagonist here in this book, uh, uh, David Selig, uh, born the same year, uh, lived in the same area of New York City, uh, and they even went to the same uh, university, uh, Columbia University, back in the uh, 60s, uh, late 50s, 60s. Anyway, uh, uh, it's taking place now in uh, the mid-70s, and uh, it's the story of, uh, as I say, David Selig, and he was a born telepath. Uh, and the title, Dying Inside, refers to uh, his experience in the in the story here, he's losing his gift, and uh, he it uh, was uh, much stronger when he was young, when he was a child and a, a teenager, and uh, when he first started to get into uh, a, a career as a stockbroker. At one point, that didn't last very long, I guess, but uh, uh, it was uh, strong with him then. And now he's finding that over the last few years, it's leaving him. He's losing that that gift of being able to read minds and he's always been able to count on it it served him well uh, he felt sometimes a little guilty about using it but he used it nonetheless he found it a great advantage um, but uh, now it's deserting him and he's now in the time of this uh, the story here in the mid 70s 76 or so uh, He's 41, I think, so it's kind of a midlife crisis story. Uh, but uh, the story has always stayed with me. There's just something about the his descriptions of what it's like to read minds and what he hears, and and not not just what he hears or feels people thinking, but what it feels like to him to uh, be around people that are whatever they're going through, what kind of, are they, is he hearing it in voices? Is he hearing it in feelings? Uh, he talks about at some point where uh, if they don't speak English um, and he doesn't understand the language, it's just a garble to him in a lot of ways. He can still feel feelings and things like that. Now, early in the book, we start to get the sense that David Selig, uh, former Columbia student, is very well read. And I guess as was Robert Silverberg and a lot of the story here is told in internal monologue and uh, that I've read a few uh, Silverberg books and uh, he seems to like to do that. He gets into the head of his character. So there's lots of just kind of internal monologue and, and just running thoughts, stream of consciousness in a lot of cases. But when the guy's a telepath, it's really interesting because the other thoughts around him start to kind of bleed into it. And he sees his gift as almost another person within his mind. There's two of them in there. There's his 
conscious self, and then there's this other, uh, I, not really an entity, but just another version of himself in there that's talking to him, and they're analyzing and just kind of discussing back and forth. And the book itself uh, is often in the first person, and then in the next paragraph, it will be discussing the same thing, but it'll switch to third person, as though now he's I'm not sure if this is what Silverberg had in mind, but he quotes early on uh, in here, uh, David Selig is kind of quoting to himself uh, uh, Yeats, uh, the dialogue of self, which is about you and I, you and I. He's talking about uh, himself in a kind of a uh, yin-yang sort of uh, collective or something in the mind, and, and he relates to that. So I wonder if Silverberg, when he jumps from first person to third person back and forth, is meant to kind of be that bouncing back and forth in Selig's own mind, how just how it works, how his mind operates. It's uh, usually you would might maybe kind of think that would be jarring, but it seems to work in this. You don't even really notice it a lot of time, which I would imagine might be what it was like for Selig himself. Um, but as I say, uh, the character is very well read. And throughout this book, he's always referencing uh, uh, literary figures, uh, passages out of classics, out of more contemporary fiction, contemporary at the time, um, artists, sculptors, musicians, classic composers. Uh, and uh, myself, having been in, when I was first reading this book, in college myself and was taking a lot of those classes, I didn't know a lot of these references that he was making. I, I knew that they were references to things that I might be learning about soon or had just recently learned about. So reading this book, I kind of half the time myself, I felt kind of smart, sort of an intellectual uh, exercise in reading this book because you try to figure it out. And if you're like me and you come across something in a, in a book or a story that you're reading that you just have a glimmer of, or you're not sure quite what it is, but if it seems something tangible in the story that the author's putting it in there for you to understand something, uh, if, I may often go and look it up, and that slows my reading down a bit, but it, it really fleshes it out. And I'm doing a lot of that just even when I just reread this here in the last week or so, going back and looking up a lot of these uh, uh, writers and uh, musicians and artists and things that back when I was in college, I, I just kind of let the book roll over me as I was reading it, it, kind of just taking in the general flow. But reading it back now, I get, there is a just a lot in here. And I kind of wish I was back in college to learn a lot of this stuff again, because I, 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 I've been reading a lot over my life, but I am not as well read as the character in this book or I guess as Robert Silverberg was at the time even. Now, Dying Inside is generally classified as science fiction, um, but uh, I might not classify it as science fiction, or it, or it, I guess it could just as easily be called fantasy because it's about mind reading. And that's really the only uh, science fiction or fantasy element in the book at all. And uh, it's not described in any scientific sort of way at all. It's not explained. Uh, it it doesn't come across as though it's some kind of m magic, although I guess telepathy is considered paranormal. Uh, but uh, I know they were trying to study uh, uh, parapsychology as a kind of a science or a pseudoscience. It wasn't considered magic, but we just didn't understand how it worked. Anyway, it, it's not really a science fiction book or a fantasy book, except for that one element. And uh, once you kind of accept that, and the, the rest of the world is very concrete and very descriptive and, and real. Uh, so it doesn't read a science fiction other than that just view from inside and uh, it, it's somewhat uh, uh, compelling in that way. Something else I got a kick out of when I was reading this book back in college was that uh, I was a, an art student at the time, and this book, the cover art on the, the book that I was reading at the time, has an illustration on the cover of our protagonist, David Selig, there he is, 
and uh, he looked just like my art and history professor, uh, Professor Ewing. And uh, I had taken that class from him two semesters uh, a couple of years before this. And uh, uh, when I started reading this book, I thought, oh, there's, there's old Doc Ewing on the, on the cover here, man. I sure hope he could read my mind back in those days. But uh, anyway, uh, that always gave me a chuckle. Now, as I say, I was a, an art student and uh, I got into art because ever since I was a little kid, uh, I liked to draw. I would draw my favorite cartoons and all that. And in uh, high school, I started writing and drawing my own comic strip, science fiction kind of things. And uh, so that kind of led me down a path here, but uh, eventually led me to being a uh, an art student in college. And then my career has been uh, ever since then as a, a designer and an art director in uh, advertising and marketing. So that kind of leads me to one of the other things I'd like to do on this channel, and that uh, is uh, talking about uh, book cover art. And uh, so as long as I'm starting with Dying Inside here, I thought maybe we would uh, take a few minutes here and look at uh, a handful, a small handful of uh, some of the uh, iconic artwork that has been published on this book over the years in its various editions. Dying Inside was first published in serialized form in the July and September 1972 issues of Galaxy Magazine, but it did not make the cover in either of those uh, installments. Uh, so we didn't get any cover art until Charles Scribner's and Sons published it in hardback uh, in October of 1972. And the illustration is by Jerry Thorpe. And uh, I can't find much on Jerry Thorpe. I only found four book covers that he had done. Uh, he may have worked in some other fields perhaps, but uh, of the four, uh, Dying Inside is by far the most illustrative of any of them. He, he also did the cover to uh, James Gunn's The Listeners, and uh, uh, it was just a photograph, really, of a, of a nebula in space with some uh, typography on top of it. And, uh, but uh, I, I do think that this one here is a nice representation of the book itself. I, his best cover, <laughs> in, in my estimation, of all the ones that I know that he's done. Uh, we see our uh, hero there, uh, David Selig, uh, kind of fracturing apart a nice representation of his experience in the story. Almost has kind of a, a, a pixelated look, like he's coming apart in pixels or something. Now, this was obviously done way before we were used to pixel art um, back in the in the 70s. Maybe it's more of a Fortran kind of a thing, maybe a, an IBM card kind of breaking up. If you look at it closely, you can see that uh, it looks like he's been sliced in ribbons and everything is just kind of every other ribbon is shifting over a few inches so as he's as he's unraveling uh and uh, just the colors the uh the bright red and the black the white type popping out of there real simple cover art uh probably looked pretty good on the uh shelves in the bookstores back in the day so then about a year later we got the first paperback edition published by Ballantine Books and illustrated by Philip Kirkland now Philip Kirkland had done uh, a series of Robert Silverberg books at about this time. I don't believe that this artwork was actually commissioned for the uh, for the paperbacks, though. And in fact, he was mostly known for magazine and textbook illustrations uh, back in those days. And uh, uh, a lot of that artwork was picked up for some of the Silverberg books. Uh, they don't really have much to do with the story. And if you look closely at uh, the Dying Inside artwork here, it doesn't really have anything to do with any scenes or, or descriptions in the book, except maybe in the most abstract uh, way. I guess I can imagine in there that we're, we're seeing uh, parts of his psyche, the id maybe, or the ego kind of overwhelming and overshadowing things. We can see maybe one of his girlfriends up there influencing some things, maybe, but it's, you have to read a lot into it. This, I'm sure, was published for a, 
uh, Psychology Today uh, magazine article or something about something very specific that this would really relate to. Uh, I do think that it captures the mood of the book really well, and maybe that's why it was selected here. Then in 1976, Ballantine came out with another edition of Dying Inside, uh, this time with uh, good old Doc Ewing there on the cover. This is uh, the one that came out when I was taking that class. And uh, this one was illustrated by Murray Tinkleman. Uh, he uh, did uh, some uh, uh, cover art uh, for science fiction books and, and other things in, in the 50s, 60s, and through the 70s. Uh, but he was really known for, his, he was a sports illustrator, and he did a lot of work for uh, newspapers and, and uh, sports magazines, and uh, mostly baseball. He also did, uh, I think, in the in the late 80s or in the 90s sometime, uh, uh, he was commissioned to do uh, some uh, cover art for a series of John Brunner books. So they had a nice, a nice uh, shelf of uh, uniform covers. Then in 1991, Easton Press came out with a really nice leather-bound uh, edition of Dying Inside. Look at that with the, with the gold leaf uh, embossed uh, art, line art on the front there. And here's our our spine with the nice ribbings and things. And uh, then it's repeated again on the back. Um, this is, uh, uh, the cover art is not credited to any artist. And uh, even though it looks really nice on the book here, I don't really understand some of the things going on in here. Now, obviously we've got uh, uh, David Selig here boxed in down here and his, it, but that's way too much hair for our, our balding protagonist there. He doesn't have that much going on uh, on the outside of his head. Uh, and then here, I guess we've got one of his girlfriends dancing around on his mind there. And then for some reason back here is an ear. And I don't understand what the ear signifies. Uh, it was important enough to even put it twice on the spine. Uh, but uh, uh, I don't really understand that reference um, the, there is a, the French translations of, uh, Dying Inside, uh, translate the title to Inner Ear for some reason. So I may have missed something in the book, but I, I don't recall anything having to do with, uh, the ear, his ear, and inner ear at all, unless it has maybe something to do with, uh, how he listens or how he can hear, uh, uh, people's thoughts. That maybe that's it, but uh, it seems an odd image to put on the on the cover of this book. I wish we had had a, a an artist name for this, but um, uh, we do get in this book we do get a nice frontispiece illustration by uh, one of my favorite uh, artists, Kelly Frias, and uh, here we see a really nice rendering of of things that. Uh, are actually tied in with the book. Uh, we see maybe one of his girlfriends there uh, 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 on his mind there burning up. Perhaps that uh, reflects the acid trip in the story. Then we see uh, some uh, newspaper clipping there, commodities. He was a stockbroker at one point. And uh, uh, just a nice, rich uh, illustration in uh, Kelly Frias's particular style. In March of 84, we got a really nice cover by artist Jim Burns. He was commissioned to do a whole series of Robert Silverberg covers for Bantam books about that time. So there's that nice run of uniform covers. Always nice to have that uh, for a, a series on the bookshelf there. But if we look at our Dying Inside cover, uh, beautiful illustration. We see New York City in the background there. Not sure it really depicts the character of Selig, though. Here it looks like someone waking up, coming coming to awareness or or some a spiritual kind of a thing. Uh, looks way too young to be Selig, but still, uh, overall, very nice illustration and uh, looks really good with all the other Silverberg covers that was, were done at the same time. And then we got this uh, March 2009 illustration by Brad Holland. Now, I like Brad Holland's artwork, but uh, this one is, just disappoints me. Whoever this guy is, that's not David Selling, a big brawny guy there with a big chin and all that. This could go on any book. It I see nothing that has anything to do with the story or dying inside or telepathy or 
or anything. Uh, nice illustration, though. Uh, Brad Holland, uh, he was self-taught. He, he's probably best known as a magazine illustrator. He's been in the New Yorker, Time Magazine, Wall Street Journal, Rolling Stone, uh, you name it, back in the day. Uh, in fact, the Washington Post, back in the 1990s at some time, uh, named him the undisputed star of illustrators. So that's quite a feather in his cap there. Uh, and a nice cover illustration here. I just wish it had been for this book. So that's a quick survey of some of the more popular or significant covers for Dying Inside. Um, now, the book has been out for 50 years now already. Uh, so uh, you might imagine a book of this kind of stature. There's been a lot of publications and other editions over the years, uh, translated into other languages and such. And there's a lot of really nice cover art on some of those. So I'm kind of tempted to uh, do a separate video at some point and just discuss uh, the various cover art and stories about the artists and other little behind the scenes things on some of those. I might do that as a separate thing. Um, but uh, there you have it. Uh, my first video. I hope you liked it. Leave any comments down below if you like the uh, little art retrospective there or if uh, you're a Silverberg fan yourself or have read Dying Inside and have any comments. Love to hear about it and uh, hope you come back. Uh, let's do this some more. Thanks a lot. Talk to you soon.